All right, Jesus has come, right? He's come and he's died and he's rose again and he's at the right hand of the Father now and that, that should bring us joy, shouldn't it? Okay, all right, here we go. Hey, Ro- 
silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round young virgin mother and child, holy infant so tender and mild sleep in heavenly peace sleep in heavenly peace Darkness flies, all is right. Shepherds hear the angels sing. Hallelujah, hail the King. Christ the Savior is. Christ the Savior is born. Silent night, holy night, Son of God, love's pure light, radiant beams from thy holy with the dawn of redeeming grace. Jesus, Lord, at thy birth, Jesus, Lord, at thy birth.
family for sharing your musical talents and skills with us. Such a joy. Please have a seat this morning. What a joy it is to be able to sing these praises to the Lord. And, you know, I was reflecting this week about Jesus Christ, the coming King, who would be the ruler of all for all eternity, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, the righteous judge, everything wrapped up into one individual. And this passage stood out. It's From Isaiah chapter 9, you'll recognize it, but there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt, but later on he will make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply their nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence and with gladness of harvest as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you shall break the yoke of their burdens and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor as at the battle of Midian. For a child will be born unto us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Amen. And if you've got your Bible, um, or if you don't, there's one in the row in front of you. Please turn to John chapter 5. We're going to resume our study this morning in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, starting in verse 22. As we come to study God's Word, we want to make sure that we are in exactly the spot that we need to be to take in spiritual truth, to study God's Word, um, but just also for our lives in general as believers. We um, understand that there's a concept taught in Scripture called fellowship with God meaning that um, we have a close, personal, intimate walk with God, but that that closeness can be um, diminished. It can be hindered. And what does that is our sin. So is our salvation in jeopardy because of our sin? No, that was taken care of on the cross by Jesus Christ. Once for all, we put our trust in him as believers, and that's a done deal. The past is in the past. But our sin on an ongoing basis hinders our relationship, our close walk with the Lord. And so what do we do about that? Well, Scripture gives us the remedy. It is confession. We confess our sins, and God is right there to forgive us at all times and to restore that close walk with Him where we are once again being led by His Holy Spirit, not walking after our flesh, but after His Spirit. So we'll take a moment for silent prayer, and that'll give us a chance to take care of anything like that before the Lord as we come to study his word, and then we will open in prayer together. So let's pray. Father, 
Father in heaven, we come to you as the one who knows us better than we know ourselves. You search every heart. You know our hearts. You know who we are because you made us. Lord, we come humbly before you. We thank you for your forgiveness, your cleansing, your restoration. We thank you that you love us so much that you would send your only son to die for us, to give up his life so that we might live, so that we can have eternal life through him. We can have abundant life. We can have our sins wiped clean. And we have that gift of eternal life that comes only through his sacrificial death on our behalf. Lord, as we come to your word this morning, we are reminded of your almighty power, of who you are, the king of the universe, the eternal, the sovereign, the almighty one, the one who judges perfectly, the one who is completely righteous, the one who would love us so much as to send your son as a baby, who we celebrate this time of year, that God became a man by becoming a baby. Lord, we ask that this time we have in your word this morning that you would teach us through it, that you would show us the things that you want to show us on an individual basis that impact our lives right now, today. But you would also teach us your word. May this study add to our understanding of who you are. May it add to our understanding of your word, which guides and directs us. That as we study your word and we come to know the totality of your message to us, we get to know your mind. We get to know your heart. We get to know your son. These are powerful things, Lord, and we ask that we, as we come to this portion of your word, would be attentive, that we would um, pay close attention, that we would seek to, to know you through it, that we would have an expectation that you are going to meet us powerfully anytime we open your word, that you're going to speak to us through it. As we Read these words. These are not the mere words of men, but these are the words of God. May that inspire and encourage us. May it humble us and transform us. We ask that you would bless this time that we have in this portion of your word, that you would illuminate it through your Holy Spirit. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just to kind of set the stage of where we've come from, where we've been, Last time, our, our message here in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, was titled, Like Father, Like Son, and there's this confrontation between Jesus and the Jewish religious leaders in the temple courtyard, and they're upset because he says, um, you know, I can heal on the Sabbath because my father is always at work, and he basically, according to verse 18, says, made himself equal with God, and this gets their ire up. I, I had a, an interesting encounter not too long ago. Um, in the course of this conversation, um, something related to uh, my family came up, and uh, I just made a straightforward statement, and the other individual, who I'm not going to name, uh, laughed. I thought, well, you know, they don't know the reality of what they're laughing at, but the reality is if they knew, they would not probably be laughing. And that's exactly the case with Jesus Christ. He is saying that he and the Father are one and the same, that what the Father does, the Son does, that they are um, co-equal, co-eternal is what we would say in theological terms. And so as we looked at last time, we'll just recap very briefly it says that now that Jesus makes this claim that not only is he a Sabbath breaker, but now he's claiming equality with God, um, that this really gets them upset. They become furious with Jesus. And these religious leaders have now not just one, but two charges against Jesus. First is Sabbath breaking, healing the man on the Sabbath. And then second is blasphemy. And basically the, the crux of this whole passage that we looked at last time was how can you, Jesus, presume to speak as if you are God? These people were worshipers of God. They, they claimed to know him. They claimed God the Father as their Father. And Jesus says, well, if you knew the Father, you would not hate me. So the, the question, how can you presume to speak as if you are God, Jesus basically answers, well, how can I not 
presume to act and speak as if I am God. Like father, like son. So Jesus, it's a, in this passage we looked at last time, it's basically as if he takes the witness stand. And he's going to provide evidence to back up his claim. Three mighty works already acknowledged by the, by the Jewish people that belonged to God alone. We looked at last time there was life, judgment, and honor that appear in these verses. So the first life, life belongs to God alone. So just as you already know that God the Father is the giver and sustainer of life, the Son also gives physical life, resurrection. He can raise the dead, abundant life restoration to wholeness, new life, salvation. After life, the passage also speaks of judgment. Jesus testifies that this is how these mighty works um, speak to, acknowledge that he is God, because these are things that belong to God alone, but he is claiming them as his own. So life, then judgment, the ability to give life the Father has also, in addition to that, given judgment to the Son. He has set him in charge of making all the biggest and most appropriate, in fact, all judgments, the ones that matter. Now, certain judgments during this time have been delegated to human authority, haven't they? That's why we have governments. That's why we have a judicial system in our country that we're very blessed to have. But the ultimate judgment belongs to Jesus Christ alone. God the Father has instilled that responsibility on the Son. Third, after life and after judgment comes honor. The religious leaders who worship God, who lead others in worshiping God, who desperately want to honor God and, in fact, believe that they honor God, hate the Son. They hate Jesus Christ. And he says, That's not, that doesn't work that way. If you don't honor the Son, you don't honor the Father who sent him. We saw also last time Jesus has the power to give life to the dead because the Father raises the dead and has given him that same authority and power. God the Father, we noted also, is totally different from us. He is eternal. That, this passage speaks to that. He didn't get life from anyone. He didn't have parents. He didn't uh, you know, have life passed on to life the ongoing process of biology, God is life. He is one of his attributes. He's always had life, and that life is possessed by both the Father and the Son. The fact that Jesus has authority to raise the dead testifies to his claim to be equal with the Father. Therefore, the connection is he is God. Jesus states 25 times in the Gospel of John that he has been sent by the Father. We looked at, finally, last time, Jesus' example. Prayer, obedience to the leading of the Holy Spirit, who indwells, who indwells him as well as us, and commitment to doing the will of God. So that takes us up to our um, text. We're going to be in the same verses that we were last time, but we're going to take a little bit more of an in-depth look at a couple things this morning. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who, who has sent me has everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. We're going to look at that this morning. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. So we're going to be looking this morning at the concept of judgment. You might think, well, that's kind of an odd thing to talk about at, uh, at Christmas time, maybe. But 
the reality is that we all love justice. There isn't anyone who doesn't want justice, especially going in to a trial or to a situation where justice has to be decided. We all want there to be perfect justice, but we live in a fallen world, and so that sometimes happens and sometimes it doesn't. But that's one of the areas of authority given to Jesus Christ, and it's, it's all wrapped up in his kingship. He is the, uh, the ultimate authority, the power, the ruler of all, and one of those roles that he fills is judge. I think sometimes maybe that's a little bit hard for us to, um, to wrap our minds around because of just the nature of our governmental system here in America. Um, we have different branches of government, and we're thankful for that because that has a lot of um, checks and balances which can keep things from becoming very problematic. There were a couple of um, cases, though, this week in the news. You, I'm sure you heard of them. Um, High-profile cases where people well-known to the country were on trial. There was um, the actor, Jesse Smollett, and then there was the, I guess, also an actor um, of a reality show, Josh, Josh Duggar. Um, both were found guilty and I know that many people in both of those cases were praying that whatever was true and just would come to light and that justice would be served. And so we pray that that is exactly what has happened in both of those instances. But what about judging? Because in, um, in our system, we have the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. And the judiciary handles all judgment. But when we talk about Jesus Christ... He is the ultimate judge because he is the ultimate ruler, the ultimate king. He is going to handle all of those responsibilities all wrapped up in one person. So maybe this is a little bit easier to grasp in, in decades or centuries gone by when there were lots of monarchies. Many times the monarch got to decide someone's fate, their, their guilt or innocence. I was just reading this week about Mary, Queen of Scots, who was put to death um, by, I believe it was her cousin, um, and that was the, the judicial ruling of that monarch. That was their prerogative. And in that way, Jesus Christ is the one who is going to make all judgment. So here's this um, scene in the temple courtyard. This is our context. This is where this all is taking place. There's this confrontation between our Lord Jesus and what he is claiming um, it raises the anger of the Jewish religious leaders, and instead of him apologizing or backing down, he digs in his heels further and he says, this is exactly what I'm telling you. And here is how, and, and as one who is being called to testify on his own behalf, he gives these, to start in this passage, three witnesses. There's, as we mentioned, um, honor, life, and judgment. Life, judgment, and honor in that order. And then he's going to go on from there as we continue next time. But I want to just pause for a minute. Um, here's to set this um, context. You had this man who Jesus healed on the Sabbath. He had been unable to walk. Jesus meets him at the temple of Beth Bethesda. He tells him, uh, you know, pick up your pallet and walk. And he does so. But then it's the carrying of the pallet that gets the religious leaders upset. How dare you carry this on the Sabbath? So they accuse, he says, why, why are you doing this? Oh, well, you know, this guy over here, I don't know who he is, but he told me to do that. So he, he, he passes it off on Jesus. And now they're mad at Jesus because he told someone to carry something on the Sabbath. They couldn't care less that he had actually performed this amazing miracle and he healed someone. And then we notice this turns into blasphemy. Um, verse 18, for this reason, the Jews were seeking to all the more to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. There they are, life, judgment, and honor. Three mighty works which testify to the fact that Jesus is equal with the Father, that he in fact is God. So as we look at this concept of judgment, to judge, um, it, that uh, in noun form, it is found four times in this passage, and in verb form, two times. So it's a significant theme in verses 22 through 30 of our passage this morning. 
So let's take a look at this. Um, we'll start off with the fact that judgment belongs to God alone. God, in addition to giving life, has assigned all judgment to the Son. Those who refuse to honor the Son also dishonor the Father, who has given all judgment to the Son. That's in verse 23. So what do we make of this concept of judgment as it relates to Jesus Christ? Well, um, in fact, I've got a, I'm going to pass this out. I've typed this up as a kind of a handout. So, so we're going to be looking at these three aspects of how uh, we see judgment um, as it relates to Jesus Christ. So the first is the judgment of the believer's work. So we who are in Christ, every believer in Jesus Christ first has been saved by grace through faith. This is also known as the Bema seat or the, the judgment seat of Christ. We who are in Christ are under grace. We shall not come into judgment, we're told here in our passage in verse 24. We are, we are safe from eternal judgment and condemnation. That has been removed at the cross, according to Romans 8, verse 1. We see that Jesus Christ bore the penalty for all sin, past, present, and future, of all sin, all time, according to Colossians 2, 13. Here we have these religious leaders, though, who worship God and hate Jesus. And he tells them that's not possible. He says, if you don't honor the Son, you don't honor the Father who sent him. We also note that at this judgment seat of Christ, every believer will stand there to give an account before Jesus Christ. And that is a, an ominous thing. That's either a great thing or a terrible thing. Um, we have in Romans 14, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's his job, not ours. And, you know, one of the things that comes to pass is a lot of times we, we see, we call that judgmentalism, the, uh, you know, the, the plank in the eye versus the splinter, according to Matthew's gospel. Um, we're quick to do that, to, to judge one another, yet judgment belongs to Jesus Christ. We're called to make judgments on all kinds of things all the time. Does, is this biblical? Is this right? Um, is this godly? Um, but we've got to be careful that we don't cross over into the area which belongs to the Lord. And that's um, many times and we can develop an elevated view of ourselves and a lower view of everyone else. And Scripture warns of that. We will all stand before Jesus Christ to give an account. Uh, we find this also in James 2.13, judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. We also know that who is the judge? It's Jesus Christ himself. The Father judges no one, according to verse 22, but has committed all judgment to the Son. What's at issue at the judgment seat of Christ is what we have done after our salvation. Right? So salvation is by grace through faith we receive it as a gift. It's a done deal. But what we do after salvation is very, very important. Many times people think, well, I'm saved, right? That's, that's good. I'm, I'm in the saved category. I'm good. I'm fine. I'm just going to leave it there. But what about the rest of the life that we live on this earth? That's what's spoken of there in 2 Corinthians 5, the things done in the body, the things that I do while I'm in the flesh, while I'm here on this earth. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So what have we done with what God has given us? The, the time, the ability, the, the resources, what have we done with that? How, how have we redeemed the time with what he's given to us? He's entrusted us to these things to be good stewards. Are we going to waste it or are we going to maximize it? We also see that um, everything that is hidden will be brought to light. That's uh, multiple places in Scripture. Um, one of them is Romans 2.16. Secrets will be exposed. 1 Corinthians 4 says the counsels of the heart, or we could say inner motivations, will be revealed. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. The most extensive passage we have on this is sort of how this judgment works is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 11 through 15. We have the fire. We have um, all of our works being tested by fire. There's a lot of different ways to test things. 
Um, you know, they can run different chemical tests, different analysis. They can weigh things. They can, um, you know, science is very good at this, empirical science, observing, testing. The test that Jesus Christ will use is the fire test. And basically, we will receive according to what is left after the fire burns away everything that is wasted. So every believer will receive either rewards, commendation, and praise from Jesus Christ. The, the reward being spoken of is um, a crown that doesn't... The, the crowns in the Greco-Roman world, they would, the athletes would run a race, and if the winner would get a crown made of... You might have seen those kind of um, intertwined, wreath-looking things... Um, they were very desirable. But after time, their plants, they die, right? So they only last a little while. But the crowns that we have to be rewarded with are those that do not go away. They are permanent. As well as commendation and praise from Jesus Christ. The opposite of that, if the fire burns through everything we've done, wood, hay, and straw, as it were, we're not going to have much left, and we're going to lament that which we have forfeited. We're going to be denied the commendation and praise from Jesus Christ, and we're going to wish that we had that. This is found in Matthew chapter 10, 1 Corinthians 3, and 1 Corinthians 9. So that is the judgment seat of Christ. So when, when Jesus Christ speaks of one of the ways that speaks to his being God is his ability to judge, this is the first, me- first one of these primary judgments that we see in Scripture, is the judgment seat of Christ, where he judges us as believers according to everything that we've done. He's going to be the ultimate d- decider and judge of what happens at that judgment. The second one is a very not well-known one, but it's found in Matthew chapter 25. It's the judgment of the nations. The nations in Scripture generally always means Gentile nations. So after, if you take Matthew chronologically, you have the tribulation, then you have the second coming of Jesus Christ, and then the remainder of chapters 24 and 25 speak of the time of the the tribulation of, of Jesus Christ coming back, not of the tribulation itself, but of the results of that. So the, there's two judgments. The first is the judgment of the nation of Israel. Um, basically, To summarize this, the Jews who accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah will enter his kingdom and will be rewarded for their faithfulness. Those Jews that reject him will be cast away, far away, into what this passage calls the outer darkness. And then following the judgment of Israel, the very next verse, Matthew 25, verse 31, speaks of this judgment where Jesus Christ will judge the nations. And those Gentile nations that persecuted the Jewish people during the Great Tribulation will be sent to hell. And those Gentile nations, as a nation apparently, and those Gentile nations who did not persecute the Jews during the Great Tribulation will be welcomed in, allowed to enter into the Millennial Kingdom. A couple passages on that in addition to Matthew, Zechariah chapter 2. Elsewhere, it's spoken of in the Old Testament as well. So there's Jesus Christ judging the Jewish people, judging the nations. And then the third judgment is spoken of at the end of the book of Revelation. It's the great white throne judgment, the judgment of the wicked, of God's enemies. This takes place immediately following the second resurrection. The first resurrection begins at the time of the rapture. And it apparently continues on through the the, um, time of the seven-year tribulation and the thousand-year millennium. And then you have the second resurrection, and that's not a good one. Nobody wants to be in that second resurrection. That's the resurrection of the wicked that occurs at the end of the millennium. At that time, the wicked are judged according to their works, and that's an ominous thing. The destination of the wicked is the lake of fire, which was originally prepared for the devil and his angels, but God's enemies are going to end up there as well. You have a couple of books open. One is the book of life. And then another book will be opened, which records the evil works of the wicked. Everything that they did, which was terrible, will be there um, to be on trial. And their punishment for that will be various degrees of punishment according to their works. We find that in Luke chapter 10, uh, most clearly, verses 12 through 14. So here, this is the judgment being spoken of. Jesus Christ, the judge, he is the king 
but you can't separate, separate out his ministry of judging from his ministry as king. He will be the sovereign, the, the ruler of all, and that includes acting as the perfect and righteous judge, the one who makes no mistakes. As we continue on in this passage, I want you to take a look um, at verse, we have a, a series of um, references, again, to judgment. Um, but verse 27 is important because it speaks, it links this role of Jesus Christ's authority to execute judgment with his title because he is the Son of Man. We noticed, noted this briefly last time, but the title Son of Man is a loaded one. And it enabled Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry to do a couple of things. If he just went around saying, hey, um, by the way, I'm the Messiah. I'm the, the Jewish Messiah. I'm the one who um, is the King of kings and Lord of lords. I'm the one who is going to sit on David's throne. I'm the one you've been waiting for. And if he pounded that, they would be eager to crucify him immediately. He wouldn't have had an earthly ministry. So he uses a title that communicates the same thing, but also allows him to fly under the radar, and this title is the Son of Man. And those who were keen could pick up on its significance, and those who were blind could not. Though willfully so, I should add. And so with this title, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ is doing something in particular. I'm going to see if I can put this up here. Um, there it is. The Ancient of Days. You remember this passage in Daniel chapter 7? This is a, a really significant passage because Jesus Christ, according to Daniel chapter 7, um, just to kind of put this all in focus here for us, Daniel, remember who is Daniel? He's one of the prophets. He's over in captivity. He's been carried there as a young man. He's living in a faraway land. And he has these, um, these visions that the Lord gives him, which speak of future things. And he has this vision in, in Daniel chapter 7. Maybe just go ahead and keep your place in John 5, and let's turn over to Daniel 7. Because this is a, a really significant passage. So on the Minor Prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 7, it says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, where Daniel is, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed, and he wrote the dream down and related the following summary of it. Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And that could be, if you interpret that in, in light of Revelation, the sea is a reference to um, the Gentile nations of the world. And the four great beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had the wings of an eagle. I kept looking until its wings were plucked and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind was also given to it. Now, a second, another beast, resembling a bear... And it was raised up on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth, and they said to it, Arise, devour much meat. After this I kept looking, and behold, another one, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast had, on, had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful, terrifying, extremely strong, large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and it was different from all the beasts that were before it and had ten horns. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it, and, before, and behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. So Daniel finds this vision very, very disturbing. Verse 15 says he was distressed in his spirit. Um, but into this, we have, so four, uh, four 
empires, essentially. You have these, these four brutal, conquering empires that will rule through brute strength. And the, the fourth one, um, by you know, all accounts, is one that has not happened yet. It is still coming, future. The ruler will be the one known as the beast, um, the man of sin. Commonly, he's known as the Antichrist. His uh, rule will be global, and it will be the most brutal of all. But when these empires of world history, when their dominion ends, look at verse 13. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given, I think I've got this up here. Uh, No, I don't. Okay, sorry, I'll just keep going. And to him was given glory and a kingdom to all these peoples, nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So essentially, these empires end and are replaced by this eternal one. The Ancient of Days is one who is from antiquity. He's he's ancient. He has no beginning or end. And he hands the kingdom to this one like the Son of Man, coming in the clouds of heaven and receives dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. This is a massively powerful title, this, this title of the Son of Man. So essentially what we have is the old empires, the old world empires, and their wicked leaders are like wild animals. But here in verses 13 and 14, the, the new Davidic kingdom comes from heaven, and it is ruled by the Son of Man. The former kingdoms were characterized by their inhumanity, their brutality. Governments can be a source of great anguish and suffering for the people living under them. But the new kingdom and its leader will be characterized by its humanity. The new kingdom is rooted in God and carries out his purposes. The mind of God meets human government, meets righteousness and justice here on the earth. Um, a pastor at the end of the 19th century, Andrew Fairbain, put it this way, the Son of Man is the bond between earth and heaven, belongs in an equal degree to both. Now, I want you to think about that title for a minute, the Son of Man, because Jesus takes on that title, um, and he does so in our passage, verse 27, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. So Jesus Christ takes this title, this Son of Man title, and um, when he uses it, he's able to communicate a whole lot in a very short phrase. A lot of times he's talking about, when he uses this title, his earthly ministry, a lot of times he's talking about his suffering that he's going to endure, his work of salvation when he goes to the cross, but he's also using it many times in an eternal sense. The Son of Man as this eternal, powerful, almighty ruler and judge. A couple of other things that strike me when Jesus would use this title. One is, he says, the Son of Man. If you can take all of the concept that we just briefly summarized of the Son of Man, this eternal ruler who is given a kingdom by God Almighty. He says, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. There, there's just such an, a, a drastic contrast to that, that the ruler of all the universe has, has no home, has no welcome, has no bed. And this time of the year, we think about the fact that this ruler, the Son of Man, became a baby became a baby. We had baby dedications this morning. God's great gift that he gives is um, so many times one that's despised by the world. But Jesus Christ, I I was talking, Holly and I were having a conversation just this last week. Um, You know, you think about 
the, the concept of, of biology and of the, the message that the angel uh, Gabriel delivered to Mary, telling her that she would be the bearer of God, of the Messiah, that the Almighty God was going to um, impregnate her, that the, the start of a process was going to begin in her womb. And, you know, how does that begin? It begins on the cellular level, you know, just the, the most basic building blocks of what will become a baby. The, the God of the universe became a cell, if you think about it that way. Cell, cellular, you know, cells divide and this kind of thing. An embryo. The ruler of the universe would become a baby. You have the Almighty going to the lowest, most basic, many times um, disregarded level. In fact, that was, you know, it's not only true in our day that children are very often not welcomed into this world. It was true in Jesus' day. Soon after his birth, you had this evil ruler, Herod, who tried to wipe out all the baby boys under a certain age. Children are many times not valued and are hated by the world. And so we, as those who know the Lord, the giver of life, have an uh, obvious obligation to stand up for those who have no voice and can't stand up and speak for themselves. This question is a powerful one. Um, I don't know if we've got a slide for this. There was the slide I was looking for. The night visions, the Son of Man. We have a passage in Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, um, Jesus quotes a passage. Um, he quotes this passage before his trial. He's talking with the Sanhedrin, and the high priest said to him, By the living God, I place you under oath. Jesus is on trial. It's a sham trial, but he's on trial. He says, Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus says, Those are your words. You just said it out of your own mouth. But I tell you in the future, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So he's citing this Daniel passage. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, he has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? Look now, you've heard the blasphemy. So this um, leader of the Pharisees, the high priest, I guess he's the high priest. Not, I don't know that he was a Pharisee. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. But um, he tore his robes. He understood the significance of what Jesus was saying. He was associating himself as clearly as needed be with this passage in Daniel chapter 7 of the Almighty Son of God. Jesus uses these words over in Matthew chapter 16. He clearly understood this title, Son of Man, to be a title for um, the Christ, the Son of God. Um, he, uh, he asked it in the, as a form of a question to his disciples. He said, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now, the answer is quite fascinating as the disciples answer this question because they, they could have said, well, the Son of Man is um, a title that God uses all throughout the book of Ezekiel. His prophet Ezekiel, um, you know, is is the one sent to a wicked nation who would not receive his message, the Jewish nation. And Ezekiel, many times, he kind of gets down. He gets a little depressed. He, uh, for, for good reason, he, he's sent to a nation that's not going to receive his message one bit. And God will speak to Ezekiel time and time again, calling him the son of man. And he does so in a way that elevates Ezekiel. It says, hey, I have given you this message and this mission and this ministry and this authority and these powerful words. Lift up your head, Ezekiel. He calls him the son of man. Now, Jesus' disciples could have answered that way. Oh, well, um, who do people say that the son of man is? Well, maybe some of them associate the son of man with Ezekiel. Or maybe some of them associate the son of man with the Psalms, with David. Um, who is man that you are mindful of him? a son of man that you consider him. Uh, or maybe they think of this passage in Daniel, where in Daniel um, we have the son of man, this one who is met by the ancient of days, handing him an eternal kingdom. But they, they don't answer that that way. In, in Matthew 16, they, 
uh, the disciples answer, well, some say, you know, John the Baptist, and, and some others say Elijah, but others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, they basically say, people recognize that when you use this title, you're saying something significant, they just don't know what kind of a reference you're making. That's essentially the answer of the disciples. But then Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter, it says, answered in a very um, profound, powerful, but unlikely way, you are the Christ, the Son of God, the Son of the living God. So that sets us up for where we fit into this. When we fit into this, uh, you know, what do you think about when you think of the God who possesses all judgment, who knows us better than we know ourselves, who is going to reveal the, si- the things at the judgment seat of Christ that are secret, that are in our hearts, that are many times maybe things that are unacceptable, things that shouldn't be there, motivations that are wrong, desires that are sinful, whatever they are. What do you think about coming before the Lord and having to give an account for the time you had on this earth? And all of us at all times are, are always at a moment where it's never too late to start redeeming the time. So if you feel like, yep, you know, I've, I've just kind of blown it. I've just kind of been sitting around. I haven't been prioritizing God's priorities. Um, you know, I'm, I'm saved. I'm a believer. I've trusted in Jesus Christ, but I just, I just haven't really done much with it. God's message for you is it's not too late. Start today. Get on track. Get on mission. But when, when you think of the judgment seat of Christ, that's an ominous thing. None of us wants to see everything that we've done in this life burned up Wasted to suffer that loss, as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. To suffer great loss and to have other people who Jesus Christ is pouring on the the praises and the accolades and the words of commendation and the crown that doesn't ever disintegrate. And you think, man, that could have been me. If you think about the, the Son of Man, the Almighty Figure, the one who is the almighty, the all-powerful. And you think about yourself in relation to him. How does that make you feel? Does that make you feel humbled? Does it make you feel um, insignificant? I would say that to a degree it should. But at the same time, who you say Jesus Christ is, answering that question for Peter, is everything. Do I recognize that he is the God who came not only to judge as the all-powerful ruling one who can make all judgments, but as the one who came to save me. Because that is the message of Christmas, is that God so loved the world. Do you ever think about that in personal terms? God so loved me that he sent his son Jesus Christ to save me, to give me new life, to give me new start, to help me break free of everything that's Um, tripping me up and entangling me and hindering me and keeping me, you know, wrapped up. And one of the things that I think is so sad is that the reason that people don't in the first place receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, the one who came and died for them, and don't serve him, is because we all, as sinful people, struggle with inherent selfishness. I think that many times, um, you know, we think of the effects of sin, and it starts right at the beginning. We, we naturally, as, as human beings, start looking out for number one, as the saying goes. We look out for ourselves, and what do I want? How am I going to make my way through this life um, the smoothest, the easiest, getting the things that I want out of life? It's all about me. And sometimes this only progresses as a trajectory through life where we build our lives more and more and more about what works best for me, and we lose sight of what has God put in store for me. What has he given me? What has he entrusted me with as his steward? What has he given me to do? My time is limited, Lord. How do I maximize, make the most of my time? Lord, you've given me these children as a great gift. Now, how, how can I render them to your service? Not, not according to what I want to see them happen in their lives, 
You know, maybe me and my own desire and ambition, I want to see them, you know, have a great job, make a lot of money, stay close to home. We're going to have all these family get-togethers all the time, whatever it is. But if we can relinquish that and say, Lord, no, maybe that's what you have, maybe that's not. Whatever. You, my children are yours in your service. Children are a gift. Salvation is also a gift. The greatest gift any of us could ever receive, God has given to us. We don't earn salvation. It's not a um, God saved us because of, because of what we will do for him. That's, that's, those are separate things. Yes, God desires for us to serve and live for him, but it's not because of what we have to offer to God that he saves us. Well, I'll save you, but then I'm going to attach all these strings. You've got to do this and this and this and this and this and this. Or I see these great skills and talents in you. I can really use you, so okay, I'm going to save you. No, 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 no. God saved us according to his grace. It's a gift given in grace. You just do things out of the benevolence of your heart because you just want to. That is God. He gives us the greatest gift we could ever be given. He came as a baby 2,000 years ago, entered into our world, grew up, lived a life on mission for God, did everything according to the will of God, nothing apart from the will of God everything according to the leading of the Holy Spirit, which led him to a place, a dark place, a place that he didn't want to go, none of us would ever want to go, and that's at a crucifixion. Just this last week, I was reading about over in England, um, I, I don't know if it was England per se, but it was on the island of Britain, they uncovered something really cool archaeologically, also really gruesome. Um, it was a, a heel bone, maybe you read about this in the news, it was a heel bone, and it had a nail stuck through it. And it was someone that the Romans had crucified in Roman Britain, and they, the, it was um, just an amazing find to find the stake still in the heel bone of this criminal who they crucified. But can you imagine the agony of having a stake driven through an ankle bone? That's horrific. And Jesus Christ went and he went all the way through. He carried out the mission because of his greatest love being his love for you. And he died to save you, to set you free so that your sins could be forgiven, wiped away completely, and to give you the gift of eternal life. So if you've never received that gift, remember that God loves you. And that's why he gives you that gift. No greater gift could be given. No matter how great of Christmas gifts you expect to receive this Christmas or to give this Christmas, the greatest gift is the gift that never stops giving, and that is the gift of eternal life. It is a relationship with the God of the universe that can't happen otherwise. We're, we're all sinners. We're all infected by the curse of sin, by being in this biological line going back to Adam and Eve, the first human beings. We can't have a relationship with the holy God, the God of the universe, the, the almighty, the eternal one, the ruler of all, except that he did all the work. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to the cross, and he died so that we all may live, and we just receive that gift, and we have eternal life, not according to anything that we did, because we're just lost sinners but according to receiving that gift of eternal life, of salvation through Jesus Christ. If you've never made that decision, I pray that today will be the day of your salvation. This day going into Christmas when you get new life and you get resurrection life and you get eternal life because God is life. And they, they crucified him, but they, they couldn't keep him from coming back to life because he is life. He rose again. And not only did he do that, but so will you, and so will I, and so will everyone who received Jesus Christ and receives that gift of eternal resurrection, grave-busting life. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this passage of Scripture so powerful. Speaking of your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord, we celebrate at this time of year his birth into our world and so much joy that that brings so much praise that that brings to our lips. So much celebration that that fills our lives and our homes. But thank you also for reminding us of his tremendous power. Of him as the ultimate ruler, the almighty judge, the eternal ruler. The government will be upon his shoulders. 
Lord, I pray that we all would be challenged by this, that we would remain on mission for you, that we would get on mission for you, that we would be your servants, that we would be faithfully building according to that foundation of salvation by grace through faith in precious stones and jewels, as 1 Corinthians 3 tells us, not according to the wood, hay, and straw, the things that burn up, the things that can fill our lives in this world but are meaningless. Lord, I pray that you would challenge us with that. And also, Lord, I pray that anyone in here who hasn't become your child, who hasn't received that gift that you offer, who hasn't accepted the resurrection life, the eternal life, that greatest gift that could ever be given by you to them because you love them, that they would do that at this time this morning. This would be a brand new day, this 12th day of December 2021. Lord, thank you for this wonderful season. Thank you for the fact that we get to come and gather and praise and worship you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, would you please stand for the last song? Are you guys glad God, God has given us a way out? Yes. You know, and he, he didn't have to in his justice, right? He would be perfectly just and, and not saving us, but he also is loving, right? And it's because of his love that he did what he did for us. All right. stand in the presence of his glory blameless and with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory majesty dominion and authority before all time and now and forever amen <laughs>